And I'm Andy Dixon, the Director of Marketing and Communication here at CSU Global. So we're very excited to have our next guest here with us. And to make that introduction, we'll be CSU Global's president, Dr. Becky Takeda Tinker. Thank you, Andy. So Mark Protus is the Director of Learning and Video for Microsoft Office. He brings to Microsoft and to all of us today his deep history and decades of experience in developing and delivering creative learning experiences, turning ideas into products, and working with customers and companies to create training and skill development solutions. He's truly an expert in effective learning through technology facilitation. His experience and knowledge is unsurpassed and with the infusion of his creativity, he provides critical and on-point information applicable to really all industries. I am so pleased and excited to be able to share with all of you around the world, Mr. Mark Protus. Well, thanks for the awesome introduction. Um, I'm um, excited to talk to you today, and thanks for inviting me to participate. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do in a from a corporate training setting. Um, I'm I, I'm going to talk about some of the um, some of the decisions that I've made personally. I'm going to try and personalize my story a little bit in in this um, talk, and then um, I'll I'll go through a, a set of um, things to think about when we look at students and how they approach higher ed and whether they should approach higher ed and, and some questions like that. Um, Becky already did my intro, so I, all the stuff on this slide I, I'm going to kind of skip over, but I do want to let you know that, that I myself have a, have a background as, as a, somewhat of a non-traditional student. Um, I decided at the age of 18 to drop out of college and I went in and out of college a couple of times, um, just moved out of my parents' house and decided to support myself and worked and um, and by the time I decided to go back to college, I really wanted it. I worked enough to, to realize that I wasn't getting anywhere in, in what I was doing at the time. And so I went back to college, figured out how to get grants and loans and work study program and put myself through college, which was great. Um, sometime I, after I graduated from college, I worked for a couple of years and then decided to go back to college and get a teaching credential. Did the same thing. I worked my way through that. Um, and after that, I uh, worked for a little while and then decided to go back and get a master's degree and um, had to start the process all over again. So I've done that a few times myself. I had to do it uh, in a self-supporting way and understand at least what some students are probably going through as they're trying to decide um, uh, how to take care of a family, how to take care of their obligations and pursue um, uh, furthering their education and their career prospects. So I'll, I'll talk about some of that as I as I go through uh, some of the things that I have today. And, and I'm uh, fairly informal. Feel free if you've got questions. I'm, I'm on the chat window as well. So if you want to interrupt and, and ask a question while I'm talking, please do so. I'm, um, we'll make this interactive and, uh, and, um, and we'll share stories. So uh, for a quick agenda, I'm going to talk about the fact that a lot of kids today are, are, and a lot of adults today are asking, should I go to college and should I further my education? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I have four different things that I want to talk about in terms of considerations that people might have when they're deciding whether they want to pursue higher ed and how they want to do it in today's climate. Um, I'm going to share my story of my family right now. I have five children. Um, I, I think uh, I'm going through a lot of the questions that, um, as I was putting this um, presentation together, I'm thinking about a lot of the things that maybe you're thinking about and a lot of students are thinking about at this time too. So I wanted to share my story with you and then um, talk to you about a few resources that are out there to, that might help blend traditional and non-traditional approaches. And then I'm, I'm very happy to talk with you afterward and, and answer questions and create a discussion with you around topics that you think are important. So if you're all good with that, we're gonna move forward. Um, the first thing I wanted to, to share with you is uh, my 14 year old has a great favorite show. It's called Adam Ruins Everything and it's a, it's a comedian who likes to debunk popular myths. Um, he got a little bit popular during the election in 2016 when he talked about the Electoral College and other things that um, he gave the history of it and debunked some popular myths around how our um, political system works and how our election system works. Anyways, he did an episode recently on, on going to college. And what I like about Adam, beside his kind of fun way that he presents topics and everything is, he generally tends to zig where you think he might zag. And I thought he was going to come in and say, yeah, in today's climate, it's just not worth getting a college degree. But, but actually, he, he started that way and then kind of flipped it around. And when he presented all the facts that were a part of his arguments for and, and against potentially getting a degree in college, 
he actually, I think, came out pretty favorably on the foresight. I think at least some of the reasons why you might choose to pursue an advanced degree, I think, um, way a little higher on the um, on the pro side. And here are just a few facts that I pulled from the show. Um, college dropouts are 71% more likely to be unemployed. It was an interesting fact. Didn't, didn't know that. Um, the, uh, the one that really surprised me was college grads make more than high school grads at every point in their career trajectory. So, um, you know, I think traditionally, like if you play the game of life and things like that, you know there's a, there's a quick benefit from choosing a non-higher ed path because you're going to make money right away. But, but in this instance, he showed a graph and showing that pretty much in every instance of your employable life, uh, having some kind of a degree and being able to to show your credentials and show the, um, the advanced learning that you've received actually will earn more over the course of your working lifetime than not. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the issues he brings up is that um, less than 1% of the jobs created in the last um, eight to 10 years are actually low, um, low uh, skill jobs. They're almost all jobs that require a high degree of skill, especially in the high tech environment that I'm that I'm more used to working in, uh, but a lot of the jobs that are being created actually require some sort of uh, college education and require advanced training of some sort. And um, the last fact was an interesting one as well that uh, in the next ten years or so, we're going to be facing a shortage of college graduates in um, in skills that require um, uh, credentials and um, and higher ed degrees. And that, that is a gap that's going to start growing in the next couple of years and just keep growing as we move further um, with our economy and with, with um, students coming out of colleges and into the job market. So um, I want to go now into to, to four things that, um, that I think are pretty critical to think about. And one of them started off by looking at this Adam Ruins Everything show. But um, one of the myths that he debunks is the, the myth of the inventor entrepreneur. Um, a lot of um, a lot of uh, people these days think that um, if I just have a great idea, I'll start Snapchat and I don't need to get any advanced degrees and I'll, I'll create Instagram or I'll do something that, that doesn't require going to a university. And, and that's, that's an interesting idea and it has worked for some people. So here, here are a few people that achieved great success by starting with an idea that uh, in college, at least for Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, um, Steve Jobs really never really, really never went formally to college. I think he more took things that interested him and got in and out and created his own career. But um, the other two guys, um, they really um, took the starting of what they did at college and they took it, they had an idea and they were able to um, not only implement their idea and launch it, but they were able to, to grow it into the mega businesses that, that we've seen right now with Facebook and Microsoft. Um, a couple of the things that, that are interesting to point out is that this is a pretty extremely rare thing to happen, that someone leaves a university environment or leaves a, a program of higher ed and just goes and creates a company that's worth billions of dollars. It happens, but it's very, very um, unlikely. Uh, with Bill Gates, a couple of things that they pointed out was that, um, you know, he was a very hardworking guy. He had tons of advantages that, that no one else had. Um, when he went to a private school in the Seattle area here, and, um, and he was able to log computer time at a time when computer time was very expensive to do. Um, most, um, most people, let alone high school students, wouldn't have been able to afford the amount of time it took for him to log hundreds and hundreds of hours in as a programmer and gain the skills that he gained prior to even going to college. Um, by the time he actually went to college, he had amassed thousands of hours of experience, again, doing something that would be pretty um, unaffordable for most people. Um, Malcolm Gladwell points out in, in Outliers that um, you know, with, with 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, you can become world class in any field. And you know, Bill Gates, by the time he got to Harvard, literally had that, uh, literally had that world class experience um, just from his sheer tenacity and his work ethic and the fact that he had these advantages to get on a, um, a public computer and, and log all these computer hours prior to going to Harvard. Um, and um, while, um, while Bill Gates started his uh, Microsoft with his high school friend, Paul Allen, he actually met at college um, Steve Ballmer, who was later to become the Microsoft president. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about the entrepreneurs that are coming out of the environments today is that 
many of them are using college as a, as a social platform to meet fellow students with a like mind. Um, they actually, while they're in college, they actually incubate a lot of the ideas that end up becoming some of the high tech companies that are, that are fast um, growing and the startups that are, that are becoming something. And, and a lot of the times the relationships that you actually make um, in a program of higher ed of some sort are the ones that continue and actually forge the, um, the initial um, personalities and the, and the initial startup that, that a lot of people end up pursuing. Um, and, and again, Bill Gates was pretty lucky in his particular education in that he could afford Harvard. His parents were fairly wealthy. He didn't have to worry about um, the business failing. If it had failed and he decided to go back, he always could have done that. Uh, and he, but he was able to take his idea and really forge it and do something with it that, that didn't necessitate a college degree. Again, I just want to make clear this is the exception rather than the norm. Um, as, as students are thinking about where they want to place their time, here are just a few considerations I put together and feel free to challenge these, but these are just some ideas that I had uh, that, that I will share with you. Um, one I think that I think is very important for people to think about is what is the goal and opportunity that you want to walk away with from any experience that you choose to do, whether it's through a formal educational experience or an informal one, whether it's through work study or, or something what what uh, do you want to have as your portfolio by the time you leave that experience? Um, in the case of choosing a, um, a college, is it is it a, the name of a college? Do they specialize in a particular degree that you're going for? Um, is there a networking opportunity by going to a particular institution of higher ed that makes one choice better than another? Uh, I, I'm not sure, depending on what you're trying to do, but those are questions I think most students should ask. Um, what are the job opportunities in the field that you're thinking of studying? Um, right now, um, and I'll talk about this when I talk about my family, but some degrees are worth more than others at this point. Um, when you look at projections for where careers are going and jobs are going, I think it's important to think about um, where you want to place your bets and, and what you think um, that degree will be worth by the time you actually finish it. Um, many students right now are working and going to college at the same time. So it may not just be the four years that you're taking, it may be six years, eight years, 10 years even to get out of a degree. Uh, I think one of the important considerations at this point in time is to think about what will, what will the currency of that degree be like by the time I get out of my um, degree program and by the time I actually complete my certificate or degree or whatever I'm trying to achieve. Um, the degrees, the job markets are moving very agilely and quickly right now, and um, not all degrees are going to be in vogue um, in the same way a number of years from now. And um, your your the time and energy that you put into that may not be worth the same thing even a year from now than it is right now. And I think these are things that, that again students um, faced at the crossroads and what to do next should be thinking about. Um, a lot of people right now are are thinking that um, once they graduate, they will be able to immediately get a job in that, um, in that field in which they've um, spent a number of time studying for. And quite honestly, it's, it's usually the, the statistics are a little less than what people think they, they would be. And the workplace is changing in such a way right now that um, a lot of jobs that previously didn't require degrees or certifications of some sort now do. I, um, working at Microsoft, I've spent a lot of time with our Microsoft uh, Office curriculum certifications. And um, I've noted even in government jobs right now that, uh, that it used to not be any kind of a requirement to have a certification, but I'm seeing that in many government jobs, even as an executive assistant, you're seeing the, the, the need now to have a certification in Microsoft Word or Excel or something else that pertains to the day-to-day -day productivity tasks that are going to be required of that position. So I think again, as as uh, as people are deciding what they want to do and where they want to go, they should be thinking about what's in vogue now, what might be in vogue two to three years from now, and and again, where do I want to get that experience from? Finance, um, super tricky issue for a lot of people. Um, it was for me as a as a struggling student trying to to make it through all of the degrees that I got and trying to work at the same time. Uh, but cost of college right now has increased a thousand times in the last 40 years. And, and I can tell you as a parent paying for students going to college right now, it seems like it's going up even higher than that. 
um, in, in a short period of time. Um, but I think these are things that, um, that, again, I was maybe a little lucky when I was going through this, it wasn't as expensive to go through school and doing work study and um, getting a small amount of uh, federal aid and things like that who were largely able, able to get me through my different um, degree experiences. But right now it's, it's a lot tougher than that. And we know that student debt is just a huge issue in the country. And um, I think as uh, students are making a decision on what to do next, they really have to consider that um, when they decide what type of um, either credential or skill set or degree they want to go for. And um, there are opportunities though, and there's some interesting things that people are doing now. Um, I don't have a lot of experience here, but, but I have seen them. I mean, beyond traditional scholarships and work study programs and things like that, there, there still is federal and student aid at the federal and state level. There are payment plans that are being made available that are, that are trying to help students at least um, um, get away from the crushing debt that some, some students the last 10 to 15 years have experienced um, financing education. And I've, I've even seen examples of students crowdfunding their education, which is an interesting example. I don't have any, any positives or negatives there, but I thought that was a cool idea. Um, as, as students are um, going through this experience, I think one of the things that needs to be a consideration beyond um, how, uh, what the currency for my degree is or my skill set is going to be um, three to five years from now is, is um, what am I going to do after I get my degree? I, I believe we're in a very, very fast moving culture right now that's um, requiring continual lifelong learning, which I, as, as someone who's been involved in education for years, I love that. Um, but not everybody um, sees that um, as an end goal of starting a program. You, a lot of people are thinking that there's a finite amount of time I'm going to put into it and then I'm done and I can go work in a career and make money. And really, work isn't working that way anymore. Um, we're always having to grow new skill sets. We're having to learn new technologies. We're having to change the way in which things were done even a short time ago to be successful. And those things are pivoting right now. And, and some things are dying. Some things are just changing. And we're in a culture now where you never stop learning. And it's important to be curious. And it's important to think about that as you choose your career or pivot your career into new and interesting areas that are, again, in vogue and, and current. Um, one of the things to consider is that a lot of employers have cut formal training programs. So you used to be able to um, get a degree in, in marketing or something like that and go into a program where you learned um, sales and marketing from a corporation and they had formal programs to do those kind of things. Um, companies like Procter & Gamble and uh, lots of different examples I could probably throw out there um, had very formalized learning programs that you graduated through as part of a corporate experience. And those things are, are changing and many of them are going away. Uh, companies aren't um, taking on the formal training as much as they did before. They can't afford it as much as they did before. And your ability to graduate up um, with the corporation paying for that or teaching you th that is, is really changing right now. And so students need to be thinking about how they might be able to acquire that learning again outside of the workplace and continue to stay current and continue to build their skills. And um, you need to be, again, prepared to grow your skills and pivot your skills throughout your whole career. Uh, there's a stat on LinkedIn where, where they say that jobs change every five years. So your ability to not only on your LinkedIn profile, but stay ahead of trends and keep current is going to be up to you as an individual. And it's going to be very important as you grow and change your career in the course of many years that you're going to have your career. And just a few ideas I thought I'd throw out there. Um, some of the things that, that uh, today's um, learners need to be thinking about is, one, how can I educate myself? I'll show you at the end some resources that are available for you to do that. But I will also say that um, it's a difficult thing to have the perseverance and the tenacity to stay with um, self-directed educational programs. Um, I ran a, a large MOOC at Microsoft that was called the Microsoft Virtual Academy. It still, still is out there. Um, but we, like many of the other MOOCs that are out there, um, we saw completion rates for people that started a, a formalized program and then finished it were very low. The rates, if you look at where things have gone, like Coursera and Udacity and other uh, edX and similar MOOCs, maybe um, 8 to 9% and maybe as much as 12% of people that start a formalized 
program in a free kind of out there educational environment actually complete that program. <laughs> Those that do, um, they may or may not take advantage of, of the things they've learned to grow their career or increase their salary or, or make benefit of that additional education that they put themselves through. So it really takes a lot of fortitude and tenacity to, to grow a career on your own. It, it absolutely can be done, and I've seen hundreds of positive success stories, um, especially with the Microsoft Virtual Academy, where people um, didn't have um, the financial means to pursue um, credentials or higher ed. They went through some of the formalized training. They were able to um, make um, you know five to ten thousand more per year with their current employer by by advancing their career in their current jobs, or they were able to get into new jobs using new skills they gained as a result of those experiences and make significantly more money. But again, I think that's a very small percentage of the population that has the, the wherewithal to, to go through those experiences and really take advantage of some of the things that are out there. Uh, building a business is an awesome thing to do if, if you have, the, the again, the tenacity to do that. I think there are a lot of opportunities that avail themselves now to people who can work at the same time in a regular job and build a business on the side. You see a lot of that done, not only like with Amazon.com, and all, there's all kinds of small businesses that people are able to be at, begin, and that is a great uh, career, career trajectory if you have, again, the wherewithal to, to self-direct yourself through something like that. Um, one of the concepts that's been out there for quite a long time is, is building a brand of yourself. Um, I remember reading a book in the late 80s, early 90s um, called When Elephants Learn to Dance, and it talked about looking at yourself as a corporation and essentially building a brand around your corporation. So if I am the corporation of Mark Curtis, I may decide to align myself with Microsoft for a short time. So essentially I'm merging, the corporation of Mark Curtis is merging with Microsoft for a certain number of years to gain certain experiences, make money, do things that, again, have some sort of goal. And as I go through my process, I should be looking at my company every year and creating a set of goals and a set of um, a set of um, accomplishments that I want to achieve. Um, and then every year taking a look and seeing whether this merger with Microsoft is the right thing for me personally, or whether I should merge with another company at some point to gain new skills or new competencies, or whether I should go up on my own and create uh, the business of Mark Pros. But anyways, I like the idea of building a brand around yourself and looking at yourself as your own company, your own brand throughout the, um, the totality of your career trajectory. Right now, certification and stackable credentials are certainly in vogue. Um, I think as, um, as institutions of higher ed are looking at how they're putting together course offerings, they certainly should be looking at how to make it easier for students to use the um, accredited um, courses that they have combined with certifications and, and credentials that allow people to build credentials on one another and again, uh, formulate that lifelong learning that is going to be essential for running a career in today's environment. And I think the, uh, that uh, colleges and higher ed institutions should be looking at how they can um, incorporate these credential, skill building, certification, badging kinds of experiences into their curriculum and make it easier for students to understand in a prescriptive way how they might be able to build their brand and their, their skills. And uh, finally, vocational and trade schools are certainly still very much in vogue. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, in Europe, there's a little more um, nod to getting students earlier into, a, into an environment that may not be a higher ed environment, but may give them apprenticeships or mentorships or skill building opportunities that allow them to wind up with a way to support themselves and provide a career for the, themselves and their families um, moving forward. One step that I did read recently that I thought was a good one was that um, high school graduates, um, even with no higher ed, receive a 20% wage premium when they have the relevant certificate that goes with the job opportunity they're, they're currently in right now. So certificates matter and growing your, your education and growing yourself over your career absolutely matters. So right now I thought I would take a quick personal turn. I hope you're okay with this, but this is my family. These are my five kids, and um, I love them to death. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of the challenges that I have faced recently as a parent and that they're facing right now as, as young people that are 
trying to create their own lives and, and enter a workforce that's very different than the one I entered 30 years ago, uh, 35 years ago, whatever. And, um, and I want to tell you about some of the challenges. I'm going to tell you about four of the kids, the oldest one. Um, on the left, there's Dylan, then my daughter, Marissa. Sammy in the middle is darling, but he's only 14 right now, and I'm not going to get into his story. It's not quite yet relevant. Uh, but then Zach is uh, 20 right now, or is 18 and about to graduate from high school. And then Ben's in college right now. And I'm going to give you a quick background of each one and tell you some of the considerations that, that I've had and that my family has as we've looked at what they're going to do. So I'm going to start with my oldest son, Dylan. Um, he is uh, absolutely charming. Um, he lights up every room he goes into and he's got an amazing personality. Uh, Dylan is 20 years old. He has been in and out of college several times. He has studied everything from acting to music to marketing and communications. And he, the regular school higher ed environment just really didn't resonate with him. Um, in his uh, many pivots that he did personally, he ended up at some point getting a job um, working in sales and, and realized he's a natural salesperson. He's got that kind of very extroverted personality that works very well that way. He worked for years in retail at Nordstrom's. Um, for a while, he did go back to school and tell me that, that you know, retail was pretty limited in what he could earn and, and how he could be successful there. And he went back to school for a little bit. He's got right now probably a, the equivalent of an AA degree in credits but he doesn't have a formal degree at this point. At some point, he came back to me and asked me, Dad, would you support uh, me going back to school again? And this was about five years ago. And I said, you know, at this point, it depends on what you want to try because you've gone into this and it's not been super successful for you. Tell me why this is going to be different and what you want to study. And he said, well, I think I really need a good degree and I think I'd like to study broadcasting. And and I've got my master's degree. I spent years in education. I said, you know, I don't think, Dylan, that um, broadcasting is going to be a very great degree to have uh, several years from now. I know several people that, um, that actually work on my team at Microsoft that come from a print journalism background. Um, that field is going away, and um, they're looking at new ways of getting experience. I said, I thought with your um, ability to do sales and your, um, your skill at doing that already, I would look for one of the online companies around the Seattle area and see if you can gain experience in marketing, online advertising, brand building, and that kind of thing, and see if you can translate the physical sales skills that you already have and turn that into an you know, online skill set that you might be able to get that would actually be more in vogue um, years from now. So he actually went out right away and got a job at Zillow, and he worked there up until recently for about three years and did several positions and was quite successful even without a degree. He did um, several jobs in marketing and sales, and was doing very well, but he decided recently that um, that he's been building a blog and it's a personality driven thing that he's really wanted to do both time to. He also has always wanted to do acting. And so he figured that this was a good time to leave uh, kind of the comforting corporate job that he had and take a risk. So he moved to Boston recently. He's he's betting the farm on on a blog that I will shamelessly promote called Dylan Eats World. And he's been doing it off and on for a couple of years, but he, it's about food experiences and music experiences and, um, and kind of reviews that he does that are, that are humorous and interesting. So um, anyways, he's, so he's, he's doing that right now. And he's, um, he's also making uh, use of his experience by becoming a gig worker on the Upwork platform. So he's, um, he uses his marketing background and his experience with Zillow to help um, real estate agents create and run <clears throat> marketing campaigns um, on the Zillow platform. So he's able to have some fun right now and do that and uh, make use of his skills. Doesn't have a degree program. Don't know if he will finish a degree program. I think at some point, if he decides to come back into a traditional corporate environment, at some point he's probably going to need that. And he may uh, go back to a certain company and do that at some point. And then maybe the company may pay for his, um, his finishing up his degree, or he may have to fund that himself and and do that. But, but I don't know what the future holds. but I think right now he's in a, um, based on the things that he wants to do and, and his personality driven stuff, he's, he's in a pretty good place and he may not require a degree. We'll see. Uh, next up is Marissa. God, I love her. And I love this photo that she took um, as Rosie the Riveter. Um, she's 26 years old. Um, she's deaf. And um, that has its own fair share of challenges um, that, that she's had academically and otherwise. 
She's actually gone to college a few times. She has an AA degree. Um, she's been to colleges that specialized in working with deaf students. She's been to Gallaudet University and she also attended Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. Um, both of those, she was in degree programs that weren't really going to uh, amount to much when she finished. And we talked about that quite a lot. And um, they weren't, uh, she was in, um, in programs that really didn't have much of a job prospect after she got out. So I think she had the fortitude to finish school and she was doing actually quite well in school. She has about a 3.3 or 4 grade point average. So she's done well in school, but she didn't really have much of a career trajectory tied to her degree and her degree accomplishment. So we talked quite a bit and she decided instead to come back home and to go to a the Washington Aerospace Technology um, School, which is a which is a trade school essentially. And she got a certificate in um, in doing composites with um, with planes. So she can do fiberglass and all kinds of interesting graphite composite stuff. She's actually working in the aerospace industry now, working for a supplier for Boeing and hoping to get a job at Boeing. Um, is a degree in her future? I'm not sure. I think ongoing certifications absolutely are going to be necessary for her. And if she gets a job in Boeing or, or, or continues to do what she's doing right now, she, she will make um, pretty good money. And I think though she'll need to continue the amount of certifications and credentials that she gets to continue to grow her career in her areas. Uh, ben. He's 20 years old. He is right now a computer science major at Loyola Marymount University in California. He really enjoys theater and, and the bottom right is a play that he's in this weekend. I'm gonna to go to California to go see him. I'm super excited. But he's in a play this weekend, but he also knows that um, he needs to make a living. And um, he's very good at strategy and computer coding and things like that. So he's been working as a computer science major. Some of the reasons that we chose Loyola, just so you know, um, we had a lot of considerations when he was trying to pick schools to go to and why we would pick one school over another. Loyola, um, he got accepted as a computer science major from the get-go. That was a really important thing. He, he had made it into the University of Washington, which is, a, which is a pretty highly regarded school, especially for computer science, but he was accepted as a business major initially and he would have had to work his way in the computer science major. That might have taken him a year and that might have put him a year off of graduation and so that was one of the considerations that he made when choosing the school. Um, he also really likes doing theater and shows, uh, participating in shows as a singer and so forth and so he wanted a school that he could minor in theater and so Loyola offered that opportunity. Um, we were looking at all kinds of scholarship uh, programs and work study programs so at Loyola we were able to get um, probably close to half of his tuition paid in academic scholarships which was great. And then he was able to um, get work study as part of that as well. So he's been working the last couple of years about 12, 15 hours a week um, in the work study program. Uh, last summer, he was able to get an internship experience at, um, at a company in India, which was a great um, opportunity for him. And that's, that's him at the Taj Mahal with one of his coworkers last summer. And he's right now looking for a senior year uh, internship at Microsoft or some other company doing computer coding. And right now, given his major of uh, computer science, his future is looking pretty bright, uh, and his experience he's gotten is pretty good. Um, the product he worked on last summer was working on a HoloLens application, so he's working with um, augmented reality and the kind of some of the latest technologies. So that bodes well for him getting a job in computer science. And right now, there's there's uh, plenty of jobs in that industry, so I think the future is looking pretty good for him, and he seems to really enjoy what he does. So I think he's looking pretty good right now. And finally, Zach is my 12th grader this year. Um, he's 18 years old. He's a high school senior. He's done super well in school. He's got a great grade point average. He got a National Merit Scholar commendation. Um, he also loves to compete in esports, and he he actually joined a competitive team last summer and was competing. I don't know if you call it professionally because I don't think he made any money doing it, but um, he certainly got uh, got onto a team that you had to compete to get into and competed in several tournaments and things like that. So some of the decisions that he's looking at right now is he's going through the process and he's he's got 11 schools he's, he's applying to for next year. Um, there, what kind of scholarship opportunities are there? Are, can he get some or all of his um, higher ed paid for? Um, where is that school gonna be? He, he very much is interested in, a, in an academic experience, but he also wants to be near a city that's got some, some nightlife and other things going on. 
And then he has an idea that he really wants to study, um, he wants to work in renewable energies, but he wants to run his own company. So he's looking at maybe getting a core major in math or physics and then going on, then working and then going on to get an MBA. And so those are some of his considerations as he's um, deciding what to do. I think he's gonna go down a pretty traditional route of choosing a, 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 a traditional higher ed institution to go to. And I think he'll go through some sort of regular degree program but I, I'm, I no doubt believe that he'll augment that with certificates and other experiences that will be additive to whatever formal experience he gets. So that's my family. And that, those are some of the considerations I have. Please feel free to ask questions about that as, as we wrap up. Uh, the last thing I was gonna mention is that um, there are a number of resources out there that, that you should consider as you're looking at um, ways to, um, to, to explore opportunities beyond the traditional ones. Um, Noodle.com and College Navigator both provide lots of assistance in finding institutions of higher ed that might um, be good for your particular situation. There's also lots of pointers to online opportunities at both of those locations that are, that are really good to look at. There are a number of um, skill building opportunities like Allison, LinkedIn, and the Microsoft Virtual Academy that I mentioned before that give you practical skills in technical subjects that are that are in vogue right now and um, often make up the productivity kinds of scenarios that most people in the workplace today um, need to be successful. So those should be considered along the way. There's lots of MOOC-like experiences, edX, Coursera, Udacity. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to, to either formally or informally um, continue learning. And those should be looked at. Um, and I think, again, given the trajectory of a career today, I think those are going to be needed at some point within your career um, lifetime to, to be proactive and to be self-directed to go into some of these experiences on your own. Um, there are also um, uh, sites like Degreed that allowed you to aggregate your lifetime learning onto one portal, much like LinkedIn. With Degreed, you can go in and you can talk about um, not only the formal degrees you've received in, in institutions of higher ed, but you can add on credentials you've received at places like the Microsoft Virtual Academy or courses you've completed at LinkedIn and other maybe experiential things that you've participated in that have to do with the workplace and help you advance your career knowledge. Uh, there's some interesting new opportunities like master class that are out there where uh, right now I think almost anybody if you're really interested in, in studying uh, very particular fields, it's an amazing opportunity to learn script writing with David Mamet or learn um, tennis from Serena Williams. I mean, these are amazing people that they're true masters in their field of um, endeavor. And you can actually go to Masterclass and, and take um, courses from these masters and, and just, um, you know, grow your own uh, skill set, be curious and learn more. And then um, there's a lot to be said about things like immersive experiences like uh, Full Stack Academy. And in this case, Grace Hopper's partnered with Full Stack to bring women into the coding world, but coding camps and, um, and hard skill um, kind of experiences are, are super important. And a lot of people, especially in the Silicon Valley, are using that as a way to migrate into a new career that, that will allow people to participate in the coding and development as, as a growth area or a new area to, to uh, retrain or, or to grow a new career. Um, and that may or may not um, be a part of a formal educational experience. So those are some some online resources. I'll be happy to share the deck with everybody, and um, and I'm very happy to take questions and and talk with Becky and and, and all of you about um, any any ideas that you have or or discuss anything you'd like to discuss. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your unique perspective as a business leader, as well as your personal experience as a father. I think that was very Thanks. beneficial to kind of see how you're you're facing the same challenges that many people are today. Um, we do have a few questions. I want to remind all of our attendees, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and roll on over your, your, the video and you'll be able to click on that to, to ask a question of Mark. Um, but I have a couple in the queue here already for you. Great. Uh, the first one is, have you seen a way, how have you seen the way that people learn evolve since you started at Microsoft? Um, well, um, I think that when I first began at Microsoft, which was in 1991, it makes me feel really ancient at this point. Um, um, I, I will say that the computer industry at the time 
was very much made up of non-traditional people. And when, when the computer industry first started, I worked with a lot of really, really interesting people from very diverse backgrounds. Many did not have formal degrees. Some had formal master's degrees or PhDs in areas that didn't have anything to do with computers because the personal computer industry was really just beginning. So I worked with um, people who had, um, had master's degree and worked at the Prada in, in Madrid and, and then somehow got into doing documentation for software. And I worked with coders who at the time maybe had little or no college, but had learned through a lot of self-study how to code and do things. So that was in 1991. And what I saw, I worked at Microsoft for the next nine years. And what I saw was that more and more formal education was required as the industry started growing. So the self-taught, um, uh, roll your own, do it yourself kind of personality was so slowly being replaced by um, more formal programs that were, that were being created to, um, to teach to these new job opportunities. And then it's really interesting. And what I saw in the next 10 years or so was just much more of that. It, it wasn't just to get a job at Microsoft that, that you now had a degree and a natural curiosity, but you might have needed an MBA at Stanford or you might have needed um, to come out of the Kellogg School or something like that with, with a very formalized degree from a very um, prestigious university to land some of these entry level jobs. And I'm kind of seeing that now, now as I'm going full circle over the last 25 or so years, I'm seeing that change back to some kind of hybrid right now where formalized degrees are certainly um, almost generally re required to get in the door. But then someone's ability to have um, gone into a startup and shown their proactive, let's get things done nature is also highly regarded right now as well. So I'm seeing things come back around that way to a combination of formalized learning experiences that you can prove with um, curiosity and um, proof points. Like, have you written an app? Have you put it out there on a marketplace? Have you had any success at a startup? And using those kind of experiences to, to essentially grow your reputation and and build and be able to um, come into a place like Microsoft and be successful. Awesome. Uh, next question, kind of kind of along the same themes of informalized education. You know, I, I think a lot of people here would agree with this question that, you know, do you think that, that those MOOCs and informal and all that is actually a threat to traditional higher education or is it more additive in nature? I, I believe it's additive. I, I um, I know when I started the Microsoft Virtual Academy, a lot of Microsoft partners saw that as a threat uh, because they thought I was competing for students that would have paid for um, for technical educational experiences with this free platform that we were creating. And I always believe that I still believe that it's a completely additive thing, that the world is changing and that um, your ability to be self-directed and find information is, is purely a uniquely individual thing. And, and I think that these kind of experiences should, should, should be complementary to traditional education and um, traditional education offerings or, or the universities offering traditional paths and traditional degrees should actually be taking cue from some of these um, MOOCs and some of these experiences that are out there because these often are the degree programs that are gonna matter three to five years from now. You know, I, I think there were very few schools that 10 years ago offered anything in the data science field. And right now, um, that's a hugely growing credential program and it's a huge program for a lot of schools right now. And a lot of departments are actually, institutions of higher ed are actually growing credentials and higher, higher level credentials in that area. And a lot of that's just come up in the last 10 years. So I think that if, if the world is working well, these two things should complement each other and they should be additive to one another and they should inform one another, quite honestly. That's awesome. When, when you're looking at the shorter term ones outside of a degree, our next question is how do you distinguish which of those certificates or certifications are the most valuable? I, I really think back to the point of what is it that you, what's your end goal and where do you want to be a few years from now? Um, if, you're, if your goal is to be a graphic artist or something, there are particular kinds of experiences that might benefit you more than others. Looking at, uh, looking at the way that things in the creative arts are going, um, maybe going through Adobe and getting some of their certifications might be a, a smart thing to do if, if I was in that field, because um, that seems to be the, the cloud platform of choice. It works across many devices and platforms and a lot of companies are hiring people with skills in those areas. So, you know, if I was in, again, a creative video, graphic, um, that kind of field, I might choose to, 
very specifically to pick an Adobe program because that's the kind of skills I'm going to need upon graduation and, and a certification that would mean something to a lot of employers. Um, if I'm coding, I might, again, look at um, some way of getting the experience um, that's going to avail me a job in that environment. That, that could be going off and just teaching myself coding through a MOOC or something like that, and, and then creating an app, and then taking that app and putting it into the iStore or, or putting it into iTunes, putting it into the Windows Store, whatever, and going through that process of getting things done and having a portfolio of something that I can show when I'm done. And I think, I think that's probably the key is whatever you choose to do and whatever path you go down, whether it's a traditional um, higher ed program or whether it's a, a certification type of experience or just doing online learning, I think you should really look at what you're going to create or learn as a result of that experience and how can that become a part of your online or personal portfolio that takes you into the career that you want to um, advance in. Okay. Our next question is kind of in those same lines, but you mentioned earlier that jobs are changing every five years. And I think that shocks a lot of people. Mm -hmm. How do you, or how do, how does any employee stay ahead of that curve? How do you know what skills will be relevant? Um, I think it's part um, um, being curious. And again, once you get into a job in any field, I think you're going to have to continue to read up on that field and look at what's going on. I think you have to stay involved in forums or communities that get created around those fields um, and um, look at trends and participate in professional organizations or peers that are also in your field and continue to have discussions about where things are going because that will inform you on where you might need to take your skill set for, for some of the things that are coming up. Uh, for instance, for me um, in learning, in the last 10 years, something very different that I didn't have to do before is I have to prove all, all of the effectiveness of, of the educational programs that I create with data. And I've had to learn how to, um, beyond building cool Excel spreadsheets and pivot tables, I've had to learn how to um, actually look at data and analyze it and look at trending in that way and look at um, where I see things going. And another thing that I've had to learn to do very, um, very specifically is listen. Um, I, when you create uh, programs like, like I do that, that we launch to the public, uh, we have a lot of hypotheses of where we think this is going to be helpful for people or how we think this is going to grow a, a, a community or, or people's skill set or whatever. And then actually, sometimes you need to just stop and listen because uh, oftentimes the hypotheses that I went in thinking I was going to nail and just prove, um, I might actually hear something very different from the users of that experience. And by looking at what they tell me, by looking at the data, by looking at what's going on, it, it actually may pivot my thoughts into a different direction that I might not have contemplated even a few months before. But by, by following up on that and iterating on, on the listening that gets done, it allows me to run new experiments and try new things that I might not have done otherwise. That's great. Next question comes from Chris, and I think it's one that um, you'll have a personal opinion of, definitely. He writes, my wife has adult onset hearing loss. She was a project manager with learning and development and now works with a community agency trying to help children and families meet the challenges of deafness. Does online learning op offer opportunities for children with hearing loss and, and other disabilities? I'll open it up even more. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what I will say is that some of the most amazing things have happened since, so my daughter became deaf as a result of an illness. Uh, roughly 25 years now ago. Um, and I knew nothing about deafness and I had to, to learn a lot of things. And um, I went to tons of different resources and tried to figure things out. And I often imagine what her life would be like now when she was, now she's 26 and I, I, I didn't have a clue, but technology has really expanded her options. Um, just having a mobile phone that's a small computer that she can carry with her, like literally she can go into the bank, into any restaurant, whatever, and she can have a conversation with anyone. Um, and she can um, get, she can do anything she needs to do that way. She can um, uh, utilize um, all kinds of things on the web right now, like let's say YouTube videos and things like that, where closed captioning is often a part of that platform. And right now accessibility is often woven into almost every technology platform that's out there. I know we spend a lot of time at Microsoft on, on in fact, we have courses on how to make um, how to use Office to make things accessible for everybody. So um, we, her ability to um, self-consume all kinds of information 
that actually is accessible and allows her to take it in in the same way that anybody else would. It has never been better at this point in time. So the ability for technology to improve her prospects and her options is enormous. Um, last week, she was actually getting ready to interview for a job at Boeing, and she was able to use um, an online video service to practice interviewing with an inter with, with someone who signed um, it, with a video camera on her computer and, and do a practice interview that way. That was one cool thing. And, um, and sh she's able to study, actually. Um, there's a STAR method for, for, um, for interviewing where you're supposed to use very specific concrete examples and so forth. And she's able to learn all about that through um, website and videos that were closed captioned. And she came back and I had actually known about the STAR method and I was gonna have her come over and teach her about it. And she came over to my house and told me about it. So she was well aware of how to do it just from self um, study on the internet. That's amazing, great. And I know we're just about time, but I'm gonna ask you one more quick one here. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe it's not a quick one, but I'd, it'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Do you think companies like Microsoft and others in the tech industry play a unique role in helping higher education evolve into the future? Um, I certainly think that they will, because I think that as we look at what's gone on again in Europe, if we look at a, a pretty formalized system of apprenticeships and mentorships, and then we look also at the data point that, you know, in 10 years, there's going to be... Um, uh, a vacuum of high skilled job openings. I think that corporations are gonna to have to fill that vacuum with formalizing more and more education as part of working at a company again. So I think that while companies have de-invested in training in some ways, I think they're gonna to have to reinvest in getting people the kinds of experiences that are gonna be very practical for today's workers, as well as the idea that, we, that learning is a lifetime experience now. So I think companies are gonna to have to step up and it's not just helping to pay for a, an MBA anymore um, that, that they provide assistance with. It's going to be actually encouraging you picking up a, a computer language or getting a credential of some sort or a badge of some sort and then, and then providing you with on the job experience to take that, uh, that job or that badge or that credential to the next place and give you other experiences that it helps the company grow and it's going to help the individuals within the company stay relevant and um, meet today's challenges. So I think it's going to be, a, again, a partnership that's required in the future. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for your time. I really appreciate your unique insights. Um, I'll let Becky say a quick goodbye. <laughs> thank you, Mark. We appreciate all that you shared and so interesting as students and non-traditional students and your ability to move your family forward in a very non-traditional way so that they can be the individuals that you've raised them to be. So right. congratulations. And thank, thank you so you much. For sharing. Thanks. And thanks for having me. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate your time today.